Welcome to a new series that digs into the incredible beers and stories of the Trappist breweries. These are beers made within the walls of a Trappist monastery by or under the supervision of monks and purely for the upkeep of the monks' way of life or good causes. Despite that, or maybe because of that, they have had a huge impact on how and what we drink today. Some of the best beers in the world come from Trappist breweries, but not a huge amount is known about them due to the limited access lay people have to them and a little bit of that classic Belgian brewing mysticism. We hope one day to visit as many as will let us in, but for now, we're going to be taking you through them one by one to give you the history, the impact, and of course the flavours that they have given the world, all from our own place of worship, the Brudio. So in the last episode of this series, we focused on one of the oldest Trappist monasteries, got, you know, records back to the 1200s. Mm. This time we're going to talk about quite a modern one, in that it was founded in 1835. Mm. But it is the most recent Trappist brewery. So the most recent to be given that designation. So the newest of the Trappist breweries. And as such, it only has one beer. And it is, in fact, in England. Hey, come on. That's great. So this is uh, Tint Meadow. That's the name of the beer. Um, or it's Mount St. Bernard is the, the, the name of the monastery. It's in the Midlands. Nice. Um, like I said, it's founded in 1835. Actually, the building that they have now, I think, was finished, built in 1844. Um, so it's got a long old history, longer than some of the Belgian ones, mm. um, and has some brewing heritage back then. There's some records of visitors enjoying the table beer, but the recipe for that has sadly been lost. So this is an entirely new beer, and we're going to find that it's both inspired by like lowland monastic traditions and indeed British-style brewing. I think this is quite different. We're only on the second chapter of this new order of monastic beers, and we've already gone international. Yeah, I'm just making people wait for West Valletta, and essentially I'm stalling yeah, until, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. until we get to there. But I thought it'd be really interesting to tell the tale of a of, of Trappist monastery that isn't Belgian. Yeah. And obviously there's French ones and Italian ones, both of whom helped these guys get started, and obviously Dutch ones. Um, and there was an American one. I think we'll probably tell their story. Yeah, we should still, totally. Even though they're no longer, no longer brewing. Mm. But yeah, let's dig into this beer. Let's dig into the history of St. Bernard um, and get this truly stunning beer into a glass. Come on. So this monastery only started brewing very recently for a bit of a sad reason, I guess. Oh, yeah. In that they were dairy farmers. That was how they, how they made their money for the, for the monastery and how they fulfilled what Trappist monks have to do, which is work. So their motto is essentially work and pray, right? So they were farmers, but modernism came along, modern equipment, which didn't necessarily suit their way of life. Uh, and just literally the price of milk. Another topic I never thought we'd address on the Craft Beer channel. Business. Yeah, basically it meant oh, that they man. couldn't farm in the way they wanted and still sell enough milk oh, to, to make a living. That's sad, isn't it? Yeah, so they had to start looking for other ways to make money. And obviously with the success of many of the Trappist breweries, particularly like you'd look at Shime and be like, they must be like in gold beds, <laughs> gold, I don't know, gold thrones. <laughs> uh, They're like massive sort of brewery. stockbroker sort of monks that are just like rolling around. Stockbroker monks, yeah. yeah there we go, yeah. we found another class of monk. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, they so... they work hard, pray hard monks, <laughs> right? <laughs> so yeah, so they'd have looked... <laughs> They'd have looked at these other breweries and, and, and monasteries and gone, maybe brewing's the way to go. Right. And from a nation that has an incredible heritage for brewing as well. So when they started setting this up, and they've only been doing it for a matter of years. Oh, wow. Um, they went to, to monasteries in France and Italy and the Netherlands. Uh, Zunder being the most famous of those to get advice. And also from local breweries, which is really nice as well. Nice. Um, who helped them set it up and get them going. Yeah. Uh, unlike a lot of the Trappist monasteries, they do the brewing. The monks are brewing. We have brewing monks on site. Nice. And they have one lay person that's, that's helping them, like a brewery kind of operations manager. Fair days. So this was made and bottled by monks, not admin monks, my friend. Not admin monks. Not admin monks. Brewing monks. That's great. <laughs> uh, you wanted to talk about the bottle. Hey, I mean, they've, they must have an aesthetic monk because <laughs> there's something very pleasing about this bottle design. They've made some interesting design choices in that this bottom of it is actually die cut in a very odd 
uh, pattern, which must make labeling a nightmare. And also each individual label very expensive. Yeah. And uh, tricky to unroll as well. Tricky to unroll, yeah. for sure. There's, there's a, again, <laughs> like last week, there's a wonderful article by Mark Dredge about this brewery. Yeah. Shout out to Mark Dredge. Um, and it opens with this wonderful uh, one of the monks going, there's no patron saint of bottling because uh, they're struggling with the labelling machine. So it I'm clearly not surprised is, with that yeah. label. That's a ridiculous label. It clearly is a bit of a nightmare. This, this text, the Tint Meadow text, yeah. um, is, I think, hand-drawn with a quill. It's got so, it's gothic old style. There you go. uh, it's like a, a old English sort of. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's gothic. Yeah. yeah, you know. But I can see it's got like a tint through it, which which makes very much sense. That that is a calligraphic sort of. Um, uh, yeah, like you say, hand inked, which yeah. is beautiful. It is it is a stunning bottle. The, the penmanship on that is sublime. I would say almost godly. Oh my goodness! Come on. Oh my goodness. Um, right, so let, let's have a little look at, at what's on the back. Obviously we have the authentic Trappist logo. Nice. The most recent brewery Got to receive that. Yep. With this beer we return to a 19th century tradition of brewing in our abbey. When our brethren arrived in 1835, they settled in a poor cottage on Tint Meadow. Uh, now an extension of our monastic enclosure. Nice. So it's, it's a dark ale in Trappist traditions, but it's in the British brewery tradition. So we're not going to be mm. expecting any Belgian kind of character. And it's, it's also bottle bottle conditioned as well. So I should stop waving it around like a feather duster. <laughs> right, let's uh, let's get stuck into this. Whenever I think Trappist, I think Belgian beer, right? Yeah. So this is going to be totally, hopefully a revelation to me. I mean, it, it, I, it is very different. Yeah, I mean, I can, it looks very different just instantly from the colour of that. Yeah, I mean, well, so I guess like a, like a West Mile double or something, a little bit Could lighter. Be. Yeah. Um, or like the six from, from Rushford. But it, it's, it's the aroma where it's going to be very different. Mm. Should, we, should we give it a sniff? Let's give it a sniff. Mmm. Wow. I mean, it's boozy. <sighs> so I, I mean, I get kind of an, an oakiness. There, there's no wood involved in this, but there's, there's I think no that involved. comes from, yeah. I think that comes from, from the hops they've used. So it's all British hops, all British malts, a British ale yeast. Um, and what well, I mean, it could come from the yeast as well. Um, there's a particular British ale yeast, WLP 013, if, you, if you're asking, that yeah. has a kind of oakiness to it. It's a classic British kind of bitter strain. So it could be that, or it could be, you know, something fuggles, something woody about it. But it makes it feel really autumnal because it's yeah. there with toffee apples and raisins and caramel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's got that darkness, like that. that winter sort of darkness to yeah. it. It's got a little bit of like a port kind of thing yeah. to it as well. Yeah, and then right? that booziness you're talking yeah. about. like. I, I think this is a relatively young bottle. Um, you know, I don't know how, what kind of date they put on this, but this, this goes out of date in 2024, February. Um, so it's got at least two years to go. Yeah. Um, so it's probably quite a fresh bottle, but we're still getting some kind of sh cherry port kind of character to it. Wow. It's really alluring. Like it's, it's kind of almost split. You know, there's a dichotomy to it. You've got real savoury, earthy oakiness, and then you've got loads of sweetness that comes through as well. I feel like it's almost like a sort of peaty whiskey. Yeah, almost, yeah. Well. It's very complex. Yeah, it is really, really complex. It says serve at nine degrees, uh, so just under car scale temperature. So it, this is probably a little bit chill. Warm up a little bit. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're expecting those kind of characters to come out. They're wow. looking for that because that will come out a little bit warmer. Should we give it a go? Come on. Almost smoky. There's there's loads of savoury character that wow like kind of burnt caramel definite oak leathery almost yeah yeah um, how is there no wood involved in this Isn't I know it, like, it is kind of remarkable and crazy. I get that with really aged beers quite often you like I get like tequila and white oak and and all these kind of flavours that feel like it's been in a barrel but it but it hasn't which might be you know the strains of yeast might have that character definitely if you age the hops you know. If you're not using super fresh hops, you'll start to get that woody, literal kind of bine character, like chewing on the stalks of grapes. And it's really nice with the huge sweetness that's also there in the malt. Mm. You know, it, it's carefully balanced. Um, it could have gone either way a little bit much, and maybe I'd want a little bit less savouriness and a little bit more body and character. But it does mean that at 7.4, it's still a wonderfully drinkable beer. You know, you wouldn't think twice about drinking more of that, and you, you no, might end no. up in a little bit of trouble. Oh, a hundred percent. It's it's really interesting, Johnny. It's quite different, I feel, to to a lot of the other sort of monastic beers that I've had. Hmm. I mean, it has for me. It's it's like a really strong ESB. 
Yeah. You know, I, I, this is only in bottle. I'd love to see it on cask. So is that How special would that be? Because oh, that would amazing. enhance the sweetness yeah. as well and really bring it into balance, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. So is that, I mean, is that, you're saying it's, it's, a, it's almost like a meeting of minds. You've got the sort of continental European thing, but then you've also, where they've been, you know, a bit of influence, but they've also been influenced by traditional British brewing. And is that where that kind of bitterness is coming from? Yeah, I think they've, de they've definitely amped up the hops. They've definitely dialed back the sweetness, but they've kept the ABVs um, yeah. of, of these Belgian and, and, and Netherlands kind of breweries. So you end up with something that's a little bit hard to define from a British yeah. ale standpoint, even though it's all British ingredients. I mean, the closest thing you'd say is old ale, potentially barley wine. You know, but a barley wine would tend to be probably a little, like modern wise, be a little bit more sticky and a little bit more caramelly. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. This is, you know, actually, I, I guess quite close to like Golden Pride or something, just a bit darker. So it, it, it is its own thing, and I bet they really went for that when they wanted to make this, um, that sort of sits in between Belgian and, and British style dark ale brewing. It's an interesting choice, isn't it? Because I don't think instantly uh, people that love Belgian sort of beers would would like be gravitate towards this and enjoy this but it's it's as big as some of them but it, it has more you know it's not got that kind of sweet clawingness to it i think you know people people often think of like trappist beer as a style yeah and it's really not i mean it never really has been i mean if you if you look at the difference between like orval and roche 410 or <clears throat> even like you know West Letterans 8 is a jet black, slightly roasty beer compared to like a West Mile Double or, or a Chimay Blue, which is like the middle one, which has entirely different character though. So it's, Trappism isn't a style, it's obviously, it's a way of life, it's, it's a religion um, that has in the lowlands led to a certain kind of culture. Uh, in Italy, France, the Netherlands are led to a certain culture. You go over to Spencer Brewery, the American one, mm. they made an IPA. You know, it is very much dependent on what that what the market wants. You know, yeah. their literal reason for brewing is to raise money for the monastery. So they're going to have to brew what people want. Capitalist monks. Ca capitalist monks. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think they probably brewed what they thought would be successful in this country. Yeah. Uh, to the size that they need to. It's a very small, it must be the smallest of the Trappist breweries. Yeah, yeah. yeah by um, far. And partly because it's young, but also because I think maybe they don't need as much. It's a slightly different setup to... The much bigger monasteries that started much bigger, you know. Um, so yeah, it, it is influenced by Belgium, but it is very, very different to mm. those. Um, so we have to remember that Trappism, in terms of brewing, is not a style. Um, it's created styles, and maybe it's created one here, which is or revamped the old ale. Yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure that the other Trappist monasteries were like, "This is great. It's a new style made by a." Trap is probably we're not going to be treading on each other's monkey toes, sandaled toes. Monkey I don't toes. know what they wear on there. Monkey toes. Not, not. Monkey toes. Yeah, so I, I think it's fascinating. I love that it's really based in English ale tradition. Yeah. Uh, I love you know, any country that... and So there's 156 Trappist monasteries, I think. And, and you know, pretty less than one in ten of them brew beer. Lots of them make chocolate, greetings cards, cheese, bread, whatever it is. I'd love to see more... Uh, Trappist monasteries brew around the world because then we'd see more Different variation emerging. Exactly. Do you think that. greeting cards monks are just they're just the hands are just paper cut nightmares? <laughs> I think the I think the the bottling line monk his hands are paper cut nightmares. Probably. With this label. Yeah. Well, um, I think they have a machine. I don't think he's there with scissors on, on each label. Come on. Come on. Why not? <laughs> so many reasons. Don't know why I'm not? Don't know I'm <laughs> that. I love how British that is. How how sort of influence they are by their terroir almost mm. and their kind of culture their history of brewing over here you said they're like had help from local breweries, from local breweries and that kind well, of stuff yeah. i feel like you can really taste it and i guess that is kind of uh you know maybe what religion and stuff is about is about kind of being at one with your environment and uh and appreciating the good things that are around you and that might be the specific kind of yeast that they've used that's over here, or whatever it yeah. might be, right? But it, I feel like you taste the land that it's from. It, it, it's interesting to think, when they started out on this journey, building the brewery, coming up with a recipe, 
did they understand the weight on their shoulders, the expectation that would have been there with yeah. we're launching a Trappist beer? Because people have not only very high expectations because the quality of most of them has been incredible, but also they have expectations of what it's going to taste like, look like, how it's going to be bottled, how it's going to be received, where it's going to be sold. Yeah. All of these things, and they've had to deal with all of that. And I think they've done a wonderful job by making it an old school British ale, just dragging in influences from the other um, Trappist breweries around the world. It's a beautiful thing. I want to go there for Christmas. Right. I feel like this is autumnal, wintry, mm. you know, get some of the uh, Belgian monks, bring some of their cheese across. We'll have sure. a ha hands across the, the sea kind of thing. Why are you the facilitator <laughs> of this? I don't know. Like, I don't know. Like, like in the Last Supper, like, yes, bring. I'll be in the middle. I'm not saying I'm the bit. You're the beer Jesus, obviously. <laughs> no, no, that's uh, uh, that's Greg Cock of, uh, uh, of Stone. Oh yeah, he is yeah. the beer Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Well, maybe that will happen. It won't happen. Um, but this would be a delicious, <laughs> delicious beer to have with that and show variation. Good time. Um, I hope they bring out more beers. I hope maybe there's a summer version of this. You know, yeah, a blonde great. version would be great to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe that's in the works. I really don't know. Maybe we should go visit them. They have let people in. They have a guest house you can stay. So maybe it will happen. Um, but yeah, that, that is the British Trappist Brewery. Cracking. Uh, I absolutely love it. Good, I'm glad. Well, we'll see where we end up on the next episode. All right. Cheers. Cheers.